Uh, turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And we want to continue our study on the subject of Christian service. And the title of our message is Serving the Servants. And this is part 9 of our series, Set Apart for God's Service. And the verses we want to look at is verses 11 to 16. And we see in verse 11 that God gave servants to serve the body of Christ. Ephesians 4 verse 11, it says there, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. These are servants serving the servant. Uh, for today, I want to read the whole chapter to give us the context. I want you to see the, uh, the inseparable duty of character in service as we read the whole chapter. Okay, so please stand and let's read beginning in verse 1. Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of, of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as prophets, or sorry, as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And as a result... We are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried out about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Verse 17, So this I say, in affirm, together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Look at verse 20. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus. That in, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in in accordance with the lust of deceit, and they, in that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speaking truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. And he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, 
performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one has, who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and um, clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You may now take your seat. You know, just by the plain reading of this chapter, we see the emphasis on Christian character and service. Is it not? Apostle Paul, a servant of the Lord, is serving the church remotely. He is in prison for preaching the gospel. He serves in suffering. As we said last week, we don't resign our role when, in, when times are difficult. But we embrace the challenges in our Christian walk as God's will. He said there in verse 1, he was a prisoner of the Lord. He's not a prisoner of any man. He's not a prisoner of his circumstances. He's a prisoner of the Lord. Suffering for the Lord is part of the Christian service. And the book of Ephesians is one of the prison letters of Paul, as you know, together with the book of Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. And his style of writing has two basic parts, right? It has two basic parts. That's the style of his writing. There's doctrine and, and duty. What the church needs to know and what the church needs to do. In Ephesians chapters 1 to 3, that's doctrine. In chapters 4 to 6, that's duty. And we find ourselves in chapter 4, which is what? Duty, right? Paul begins to talk about how we walk as Christians. Christian living is a duty. It is a duty. Godliness is a duty. Duty demands hard work. Moral excellence is hard work. Right? You need, if, if you want to be godly, you need to work hard for it. It is a duty. Virtue doesn't come naturally. It doesn't happen to passive people. It requires what? Diligence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul said, I beat my body and make it my slave. And this is what Paul wants for a Christian. He said in verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. And whenever we see the word calling, whenever you see the word called in the New Testament, it always means the effectual call of God. That is the inward call of the Holy Spirit in salvation, bringing you from dead into life. That's the calling of the Holy Spirit, the inward calling. When God called you out of darkness into His kingdom, into the light. In other words, what Paul is saying here is, we need to walk in a manner worthy of our salvation. Walk means what? It means lifestyle. Walk means the condition of life and how we live. Walk means habits. Walk means practice, what you do, where you go, and how you make decisions in life. And Paul said we need to walk worthy of our salvation. Paul is saying we, we walk differently from the world. From the unbelieving world, it says in verse 17, we no longer walk like Gentiles or pagans because the world is so useless in their minds, right? Verse 17, because the world is darkened in their understanding. And he says in verse 20, but we Christians alone do not learn Christ this way. That is our old life. That is our former manner of life, verse 22, and we lay aside the old self. 
and verse 24, and we put on the new self. The new self. It says there, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And this is our duty as Christians. And so are you performing your duty? That's a big question. Because we need to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And this duty is the duty of the servants of God. Listed in verse 11, it says the apostles, prophets, evangelists, preachers, and teachers to equip, to establish, and build up the body of Christ. In verse 13, to what? Look at your Bibles. Verse 13, to a mature man, to spiritually mature men. Of course, men and women, a people of virtue and moral excellence. In righteousness and holiness, verse 24. And this is the context where Paul speaks about spiritual gift. Right? It is in the context of Christian living, a holy living. It is in the context of Christian living. Because the main ingredient in Christian service is not primarily the spiritual gift. The, the, the main ingredient in Christian service is character. Character. Character is everything to Christian service. We have a lot of gifted professing Christians, a lot of uh, gifted churches, but ungodly, disobedient, undisciplined, therefore what? Useless, unfit, unworthy, even to be called Christian. And they're excluded from the life of God, verse 19. Excluded from the life of God and the duty of the pastor and teacher is to equip the saints for the work of service. And the equipping is more on the character. On the character. And that is to prepare your character so that you can be useful to God. And the question is, what did we receive from the Lord? Right? And the obvious answer to that is in verses 7 to 10, we receive spiritual gift. And so I want to talk about the servant's resource. That's where we need to begin. What do we have as Christians? What are our resources? And there are three key words I want to mention this morning. First word, uniqueness in verse 7. Second is freeness in verse 8. And a third word is completeness in verses 9 to 10. That's what you have. That's what you have. Verse 7, uniqueness. It says there, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so people today want to be unique. Allowing the culture to dictate who they are. And they look at the wrong places. They search the internet. And they're trying to use that to, um, to be unique. But the source of uniqueness is Christ. And that's what Jesus said, apart from me, what? Ye are nothing. Now here in verse 7, Apostle Paul begins with the word but. Right? In verse 7, this is to contrast verses 3 to 6. If you look at verses 3 to 6, he's talking about unity. And then in verse 7 to 11, which is diversity. And so the word but is the contrast um, from talking about all in one spirit, Paul said in verses 3 to 6, all in one faith, all in one baptism, all in God, all, and contrast that to each one. And that is from all to each one, unique, un united by you, but unique, in other words. Integrated but distinct. And again, one illustration of the church is the human body. We are called the body of Christ, right? And the body has different parts. One body, united, diversity, or diversified different parts. The point is, unity is not uniformity. That's the rule. Our body doesn't have all eyes or all hands. In basketball team, not all are point guards. So some are shooting guards. Some are um, small forward and the power forward and the center. Sorry, I don't know hockey. So... Take note of the illustration. In other words, it has different roles. There is a unique 
roles. That Jesus Christ, He has a personal relationship with you, uniquely forming you. And then when we gather as a church, it results in a unique body of believers. As the Lord builds you individually, transforming you, building you up, sanctifying you. And when we gather, we are a unique body of believers. He builds His church. He builds through your spiritual gifts. Your unique spiritual gifts. And so if you think about it, listen, the feature and the characteristics of this church, the quality, the hallmark, the trait of this church is based upon the individual character, quality, and traits and hallmark of each one. And so therefore, a worldly individual will produce a worldly church. A shallow individual produces a shallow church. A spiritually weak individual, when we gather, and if we are all weak, we're not you know, living in the manner worthy of our calling, we're not disciplining our body, and when we gather, we're all superficial, hypocrites, weak Christians. We're not even worthy to be called Christian, if that is the case, Right? But holy, strong, mature, serious in God, in individual believers, if you're holy and serious, strong, it produces a healthy church. And spirit-gifted, unique individuals will dictate on how this church will, will go. And so basically, how we live our lives individually will dictate on how this church will, will go. Sadly, many professing Christians look for uh, programs and, and activities and who has the best ministry, who has the most crowd, right? Who will give me experience and fun? That's not a mark of a unique church. To be honest with you, that's common. That's ordinary. That is so-so. Nothing special in there. That's what everybody's doing. There's nothing special. What we want, folks, is to live a life worthy of our calling. Christian walking in a manner worthy of their salvation and employing your spiritually unique gift. That's what we need to do. Now we see in verse 7, the word grace, it says there, each one received this grace... And this tells us the nature of God. Why? Because by nature, He is what? A giver. He freely gives. It doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on who we are. He's gracious because of who He is. He is gracious. And if you look at verse 7 again, it says, This grace was given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, I have what you don't have. And you have what I don't have. Each one is unique. But we all don't deserve it. That's the point. We didn't earn it. It is undeserved. It is unearned. It is unmerited. No credit of our own. Grace depends entirely on the giver, Jesus Christ. And so we ask, how am I unique? And what makes you unique? Meaning your spiritual gift. And look at verse 7. It says there, measure of Christ's gift. The word measure will help us understand this. So what makes each believer unique? First of all, the measure of spiritual gift. The measure of spiritual gift. Spiritual gift are not determined by personal preferences. It's not decided by personal consideration, it's not merited, it's not governed by your personal inclination. It's not decided by natural abilities or skills. One Bible teacher said, we have no more to do with determining our gift than we did with determining what color of skin, hair, or eyes 
we would be born with. We don't determine that. God is the source of electing grace, equipping grace, and enabling, enabling grace. You are unique according to God's plan. What spiritual gift He gave you. It's according to His purpose, according to His measure. And so we need to understand that we don't decide that. We don't, what you have is decided by God. Second, what makes a believer unique is the measure of grace. Grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 7, He gave us the exact proportion of enabling grace as grace enables you and makes you willing in regeneration, we need to remember that it is God's grace that enables you to come to Him, to place your faith in Him. It is the grace of God. It is also the grace of God enables you to serve Him. Grace makes you willing. In other words, grace makes you eager to serve. You're saved by grace and you serve by grace and all about you is God's grace. You receive what you don't deserve and that cultivates a thankful attitude because you don't deserve it. That cultivates a, a blessed attitude and the people that are grateful, the people, the people that are blessed, what will happen? They serve. They're willing to serve. And God gave each one of us a proportion of that grace, that enabling grace, uniquely an exact grace we need to serve Him. In other words, you need to listen to this. You and I cannot go so far as God enables us by His grace. God gave you a measure and you don't try to go above that. Why? Because you don't have the grace beyond that. That's why Paul in Romans 12, he said, do not overestimate and underestimate yourself. We cannot go as so far or beyond that God enables us by His grace. And so that is unique, right? Because He gives us a measure of that grace. Some of us will go very far, like very big ministry, whatever that is, or some of us will just be in a, in a small uh, ministry, and you don't try to, you know, be um, covetous and be jealous with others, probably because we don't have that grace. And that is unique for you. Third, he gave you a measure of faith. If you go back to Romans 12, verse 3, it says there, God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And in verse 6, he said, since we have gifts that differ according to, to the grace given to us, we have this measure of faith. And that faith is not a faith in salvation, but enacting faith. That is what energizes us. That faith, our spiritual gift is depending on that faith so that we are confident in serving God, providing us energy to uh, serve Him, and providing us confidence to employ that spiritual gift. And He gave you a measure of that faith. And He gave us different measure of faith. Different confidence. Different energy. It is unique capability, unique purpose, unique parameters. And, and so listen, no church programs can replace spiritual gifts. Because that is unique. Therefore, if we're not serving, we're not utilizing the spiritual gift we have, we're somehow rejecting what? God's grace in our lives. And we're living in unbelief. We're living in doubt. We're living in, in faithlessness. And you wonder why you don't have a purpose in life. And you wonder why you feel common. You wonder why you feel ordinary, you feel average, you don't feel unique, you don't feel blessed, and you try to compare yourself to others. Can, can I ask you today, what makes you unique? What makes this church different from others? Is it denomination? Is it 
programs? Is it activity? What, what, what really makes this church differently? Try to ask that. Again, it depends on how we walk and it depends on how we use our unique spiritual gifts. We're all unique in that sense. Listen, John MacArthur said, we never get the wrong gift or too much or too little of it. When the Holy Spirit gave us our gift, He presented us with precisely the right blend of abilities and enablement we need to serve God. Not only does our unique giftedness makes us an irreplaceable member of Christ's body, no one can replace you, but it is a mark of God's great love to single each of us out of for us out for unique blessing and ministry. And then he said, not to use our gift is, a, is an insult to God's wisdom, a rebuff of his love and grace, and a loss to his church. He said, we didn't determine our gift, nor deserve it, or earn it. But we all have a gift from the Lord, and if we do not use it, he said, his work is weakened, and his heart is grieved. And so you want to grieve the Holy Spirit? Just don't serve. Don't go to church. You don't have to commit this deviant sin to grieve the Holy Spirit. That's, just stop serving, and you grieve the Holy Spirit. Just don't go to church and you grieve the Holy Spirit. And so, folks, each of us is unique in how the Lord gives us grace and faith. He gave you spiritual gift that I don't have. And so we need to understand that the, uh, the importance of that. If you're not here, no one can replace you. Very unique. Second in verse 8, Freeness. Freeness. It says in verse 8, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In other words, your resource is not only unique, but free. It is free for us, but not for Christ. That's the picture. He paid for it. He fought the battle for us. And here we see Paul is using a quotation from Psalm 68. So I turn your Bibles to Psalm 68 in verse 18. Paul is giving us an analogy here in the Psalm of David in Psalm 68 verse 18. Why? Because this is a hymn of victory. David composed this to celebrate God's victory. And we want to look at this line by line. And there are three lines, right? The first line, you have ascended on high. You have led captives, your captives. That's the second line. And the third line is, you have received gifts among men. First line, when he ascended on high. What do we mean by that? The word ascend on, on high depicts the, the victorious Lord Jesus Christ returning from battle on earth. You know, this is the idea. So you need to use your imagination here. There's a celebration parading and celebrating. So that's the first line. And the second line here is, he led a captive, a host of captives. Again, your imagination, this gives us a picture of we were once prisoners of the enemy, but now are returned to God, returned to the people to whom they belong. And so in the parade, in the celebration, there are those who were being captive by the enemy, and now they are now rescued, and they're part of that parade. And people are cheering. That's the second line. In Colossians 2.15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authority, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And we were once prisoners of Satan, right? We were once prisoners of our sin. We are tortured by our sin, hidden in darkness, and by Christ's death and resurrection, we are set free from that bondage of sin and the dominion of Satan, and now we belong to Christ. And so the picture there is Christ, the King, the Lord rescued us. And He's now ascending, and, and we're, we're part of that um, parade. We've been rescued by Christ. 
third line there, which is the, the important part of the text, it says, and he gave gifts to men. And again, picture a king returning from a victorious, victorious conquest, like a triumphant conqueror. And here, he's distributing the spoils to his subject as a gift. You see the picture? As he plundered uh, the, the enemy, as he defeated the enemy, there's spoils that he's distributing to his people freely, giving them, distributing in his kingdom freely. And Apostle Paul using 68, Psalm 68, to, prov uh, to provide us a picture of that. And so technically what's going on here is our spiritual gifts after Christ's death and resurrection, when he ascends to heaven, if you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verse 18, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so when Christ returned to heaven, he distributed the spiritual gifts to us, to his church. And that's the picture. It's free. We didn't earn it again. It was earned by Christ, his victorious effort, but we receive it freely. And so we need to have a warning. Since spiritual gift is entirely free, since not all of us receive the same measure, different spoils that we receive, okay? Get the picture. Some of us receive a very special gift, and some of us uh, receive not so very special gift. And so there's a twofold danger here that we need to avoid. First, those who receive a very special gift, you might take the credit, so you don't want to do that, and use that very special gift for your selfish ambition. You don't want to do that. And, and uh, fail to serve the church. You get that? Since God gave you this very special gift, don't take the credit. Don't use it for your selfish ambition. Second, those who receive not so very special gift, you might get discouraged and not use your spiritual gift. Oh, if I can just be an eye. I'm just a foot. If I can be just an, a mouth or an eye. You know, you know what I'm saying, right? Or you might desire a better gift. You know, the idea of uh, if I only have this. If I, I'm a foot, if I'm only an eye or a mouth, I will serve the Lord. If that's how you think, you have a backward perspective in life because if you cannot be what? Trusted with small things and you cannot be trusted with bigger things. That's what Jesus said in Luke 16, and this is in the context of money. Luke 16 verse 10, he who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. You can, if you cannot be faithful as a foot or, or, or as a toe, you cannot be faithful if you're going to be an eye, right? If you don't want to serve because you have this little gift, you will not serve even if you have a very special gift. And so we need to be reminded that no gift should be exalted and no gift should be unused. It is freely given by Christ. It is unique because you didn't earn it. You didn't decide for it. It is God who gave that to you. And some of us receive a very special gift. And some of us receive a little bit special gift. A little bit lower. Now lastly, I want to mention, but that is free. Okay? Lastly, I want to mention, if you go back to uh, Ephesians 4, verses 9 to 10. And so we receive a unique gift. We receive a free gift. And we, need, we receive a complete gift, completeness. It says in verse 9, Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is him, himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens. Now, the key phrase here is 
so that he might feel all things. That's the key phrase there. And so our resource is not only unique, free, but also complete. In other words, we lack nothing. And there's a lot in here if you look at verses 9 to 10. But again, the key phrase here is so that he might feel all things. And the term ascended and, and descended, that covers everything. That is the infinite sacrifice of Christ, paying the price of sin by descending to earth and ascended and exalted in heaven. And what Paul is getting at here is the sufficiency and completeness of the work of Christ. He rules the heaven, he rules the earth, and guess what? He is the Lord of, of hell. He's the God of hell. That means the Lord, that's the idea of lower parts of the earth in verse 9. And so therefore the Lord Jesus is the rightful ruler. He was from heaven, he went to earth and descended to hell to declare victory over Satan. And that covers everything. He is the head of the church. If you turn your Bibles back in um, chapter 1, Ephesians 1, and pay attention to the phrase, right? So that he might feel all things. Now in Ephesians 1, verses 22 to 23, look at that. He said, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as a head over all, all things to the earth, which is his body. It says there, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You see that phrase again? Same phrase. And so Christ Jesus rules everything. Therefore, he has the sovereign authority uh, to give gifts to his people. He governed and ruled these gifts. And all the work needed is done by Christ. And so if you're not in Christ, you're not on the winning side. If you're a believer in Christ, walking in a manner worthy of your calling, you are on the winning side. Your labor is not in vain. Your sacrifices are not in vain. Because in the sovereign plan of God, the work is already finished. It is done. We have the sufficient gospel. We have the tools we need, all complete in Christ. And this is what Paul said to the Ephesian church. If you can turn your Bibles to Acts 20, verse 24. We want to end here. And so Paul served this church, Ephesian church, for three years. Okay? And we want to give him the last words. And here Paul is giving his uh, farewell to this church that he faithfully served for three years. Look at verse 24, Acts 20, verse 24. He said, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. He said, So that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And I hope you see that Paul here saying to the Ephesians church the sacrifices he made doesn't really compare to the surpassing glory and work that Christ entrusted to him. Only a man who knows the unique purpose in life, the freeness of grace, and the completeness of the work of Christ can confidently say this, meaning Paul in verse 24. And I pray that all of us this morning can finish the course and the ministry which we receive from Christ Jesus. And so all of us have this work. He saved you, and we have this duty to serve Him. He gave you a unique gift, a free gift, complete. And you can use that to glorify God and be part of a church and serve Him. That is really crucial if you look at our lives as Christians. And let me take note again that what is important is character. 
It is more important than spiritual gifts. If you can turn with me in 1 Corinthians 13. Just a reminder. Right there in verse 1, it's clear. Character trumps spiritual gifts. Paul said, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Love is a character, right? It's a virtue. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And so we need to be reminded by Ephesians 4, we need to walk in a manner worthy of our calling so that we can be useful. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. If you're living an unholy life, disobedient life, it doesn't really matter if you have a large ministry, if you're living disobedience to God, that means nothing. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the reminder that you have given us this morning that there is an inseparable truth, um, Christian service and Christian character. So we pray, Father, that you help us to, uh, to serve you with a, with a life pleasing to you. We've been uh, battered by many kinds of influences, especially here in our community. Uh, Lord, help us, protect us from these um, evil influences and help us, oh God, to be accountable to one another, reminding one another, admonishing one another, helping, helping one another, teaching one another. So we pray, Lord, that we need your church as a place wherein we can correct and rebuke and teach and exhort a, a, a Christian and comfort a Christian when, when times are difficult and Christians are persecuted in the workplace, even in the home. May you use this church, Lord, to be a place of comfort. We give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.